When I first ran for leader of the Green Party, I will confess to you, it didn't occur to me that it was important whether I won a seat or not. I thought the important thing in 2000 at the next election would be to get in the debates and make sure that Stephen Harper was trounced and would not be allowed to be prime minister by an increasingly aware public. Well, anyway, as you can see, things haven't turned out exactly the way I planned, but I still, when people refer to me as a politician, it's funny, I still get a sort of a visceral, oh no, not me, I haven't fallen so far that people think that of me. And, but when people describe me as a parliamentarian, I have this sort of elevated sense of, yes, yes. And so I, I love parliament, and I love democracy, and I think that, I know, that democracy in Canada is hanging by a thread. We've allowed ourselves to become an elected dictatorship. I choose my words carefully, but the power vested now in the Prime Minister's office, an entity that does not exist in our Constitution, that is not part of our system of government, but represents a bastardization of Westminster parliamentary democracy with a significant overlay of assumptions that like the US, we have a, a top dog that we all go out and elect. And you know, the separation of powers, all the stuff that applies in the US that doesn't apply in Canada, has glommed itself onto Westminster parliamentary democracy with the added <laughs> disastrous side effect that a prime minister of Canada, even with a minority, as we saw when Stephen Harper had a minority, is able to run roughshod over a parliament where political parties in opposition put short-term partisan interest ahead of the country, and in a majority, it's disastrous. So I entered this election campaign with very clear goals. And the, the, the main goal, and sometimes people accuse the Green Party of being a one-issue party, and I have always said, no, 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 yes, we're a party for the environment, but we're also social justice, we're also about peace and nonviolence and foreign conflicts and so on. But I'm prepared to say, okay, for this election, we're a one-issue party, and our issue is democracy. We've got to get Canadians, as, as, as a people and as a citizenry, engaged in the life of the country, engaged in democracy, and prepared to say, that's illegitimate, whether it's, um, it's um, it was um, the former it's professor emeritus from Queen's University, Ned Franks, who said after the second time that Stephen Harper prorogued that we could now refer to him as King Stephen the First of Canada. <laughs> so my view as essentially a nonpartisan in Parliament is I don't care if it's King Stephen, King Justice, or Justin or King Tom, we do not have that system. I want a Prime Minister who understands that the role is to serve Canada and work across party lines. That's what I think the role is. So going into the election, I'm hoping, and I'm particularly, in case you haven't heard the news, I will, I'm happy to tell you that for sure I'm in the leaders' debates. My, my goal of making sure I put it to Justin just as firmly as I put it to Stephen and Tom. Wait a minute, do you guys understand the job? Prime Minister is first among equals, not all high king, lord, emperor, everyone bow down and quake in fear. That's Stephen Harper's full title, if you didn't know. <laughs> so far, they've only been using it internally in the Conservative caucus, but anyway. Uh, as you can see, I also, if I fail in politics, I do plan to go into stand-up comedy. So uh, I find a lot to be inspired about this coming election. I'm inspired because I know that 2015 is the year the Harper era ends. I'm in, yes, for sure. I'm inspired because I can see a growing connection back to issues, back to service, and also as the leader of the Green Party for the last nine years, we've always had wonderful candidates, diligent, caring community members, but we've never, ever had a, a roster of candidates so obviously ready to be member of parliament. So obviously overqualified, someone like Lynn Cornby and next door to you, Claire Martin, and next door to Claire Ken Mallard. We have astonishingly strong candidates that I hope voters will look to and say, that's the person I want representing me in Parliament. And that's the other big difference between Greens and the other parties is your member of Parliament, being Lynn Cornby, will work for you, not me. 
There's no such thing as a whipped vote in the Green Party. We believe in that essential connection between the constituents and their member of parliament. And when we are in parliament, which I believe we will be together with a very good group of other Green MPs, we will be in a minority parliament where Green MPs will have the ability to push for influence and potentially even have the right numbers to be balance of power to work across party lines, but effectively using our ability to say to any of the other party leaders, if we don't get rid of first past the post, prepare for an election next week. If you're not ready to do real climate action in time for and in advance of the deadline for a new climate treaty, which will be this December at COP21, well, I guess we're going to go back to the polls and find someone who is. In other words, we're not going to be afraid. We're not going to be looking at our bank account, worrying about when the next election is. We're going to do what needs to be done to rescue Canadian democracy from politics and to rescue the planet from the climate crisis. And those, those are simple goals. I'm really happy to be here. I'm more than happy to answer any questions you have. I brought my copy of C51 in case anyone wants to have me read sections of it to you for added fear factor. But in any case, I'm really so honored. Lynn Cornby is without a doubt one of the most inspiring people I've ever met. Her stand on the line on Burnaby Mountain inspired me before we met. I, when I, you know, when I realized that, oh my gosh, I kept hearing about this Lynn Cornby from Simon Fraser University, and then realizing, hey, she's like a serious scientist. She's a professor, she's running a department, and she does real, she has a lab. She's a serious, boy, does Parliament need a real scientist? <laughs> we still have people who think the Flintstones was a documentary. <laughs> Parliament. Wow, can you imagine? I just get chills still thinking of the possibility of being in Parliament. <laughs> Thank you again um, for coming in on such an, a gorgeous spring day. Uh, I'm very grateful for the opportunity uh, to meet with you. Uh, I want to start by saying a few words, but I want to leave lots of space so that we can hear from you as well. And that's why I had to run away during the introductions because I forgot to bring my little notebook uh, for the things that we hear. Why am I doing this? Well, I confess I kind of came into it um, with that, that no word because I've been so engaged in battling things, it seems, the past several years. And it was the stance really on Burnaby Mountain that launched this. Politics is not something that had ever, ever crossed my mind. Even in those moments on the mountain, it wasn't until well after that. So why, why do it? And as I've been going through the process of beginning what I've learned from Elizabeth as a wonderful way to think of campaigning, because there's much about campaigning that is, it can be distasteful, one has to kind of watch how you do it, I've started to think about it as a prolonged job interview, which is what I learned from Elizabeth. <laughs> After all, this is all about me applying to serve as your MP. Will you hire me? And so I think it makes a lot of sense to think of it that way. And it really puts the focus on our relationship. And we don't have to worry so much about what those other guys are saying because it's not really relevant, which is kind of how I feel about it. It's really about what do I have to offer you and is this what you're interested in? And so as I've been through the process of analyzing why am I really doing this, I realize that I have a really positive vision of the future. And it's the thing that kept me going. In spite of being up there with my signs that say no more this and no more that, um, all the pictures that you see, a lot of them, I'm smiling. I'm having a good time. <laughs> and I'm saying no all the time, but it's because I know very deeply and very clearly that we can build a positive future. And that that positive future, we can have a sustainable economy that is based on skills and on knowledge and on innovation. It can be based on clean technology, renewable energy. We can do all of those things. And the rationale that drives, for example, these huge fossil fuel uh, projects or 
what has happened to our food supply, for example, and the very few, very large uh, companies that are really dictating what we're eating and the bizarre things of, of food processing and food being shipped here and there. And it's all about this bizarre construct that has become known as the economy, but it's not based in physical reality. So as a hard scientist, I'm used to looking at what's, what's, the, what's, what's underneath these models? Where, where's the basis of all of this? And I'm recently, in the past few months, because I've had to come out of the lab and learn more deeply these things that I felt a little bit inhibited about, finance and the economy, and a world that I've been able to just kind of do this to for most of my life. Now I have to learn about it, and I'm realizing that my gut instincts were right.